Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is your lecture on cinematography and Raise the Red Lantern. This is Dr. Dan speaking. Um, so yeah, let's get cracking. Before we get into uh, the meat of the lecture on cinematography and how it's used in uh, Jean Yamau's Raise the Red Lantern, I want to pause and provide you with a little bit of background and cultural context for the filmmaker in the film. Uh, particularly if you are like me, meaning that you are an American, uh, this is, I think, helpful to remember like, or to know something about what kind of world um, Zhang Yimao and this film are coming out of. So there he is. Uh, as you can see, he was born in 1950. He's still alive. He's still making films today. And he is generally regarded as one of China's premier filmmakers. So look real quick at that date, 1950. All right. So born in 1950. So when he is about 16, starting in around 1966 and then lasting to about 1976, uh, so from the time that Zhang Yimao is uh, 16 to 26, this thing in, is happening in uh, China called the Cultural Revolution. And we won't go into too much depth here about this uh, subject because this is a, a film class and not a uh, world history class. But suffice to say, it is a period in China where uh, Mao Zedong, uh, the communist dictator of China for many, many years, has decided that the country must be purged of all influences and heritage that does not speak to the Chinese vision or the communist vision of China. So effectively, people who have too much of a connection to the old world. So if, for example, uh, they worked in or around the palace in Beijing, or if they had an important post in uh, the old government before the communists took over in the mid-1940s, or even if, in some cases, your family members uh, had that connection, or even for many people, just if they seemed too educated, seemed too connected to the old way of doing things, then they were basically shipped off to re-education camps and re-indoctrinated, as it were, in uh, the proper communist version of Chinese culture. Now, obviously, I'm painting this with a very broad brush, so uh, if any of you know more about this period in history, either from uh, history classes, or um, if you are from China, this is maybe something that you have heard or not heard, as the case may be, about from your family members. Um, but this is a really, really important moment in China's history, and it finds its way into a number of the films that Zhang Yimao and his contemporaries have made. Um, here are two incredibly uh, famous uh, films that are coming out of what is conventionally called the fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers. These are not directed by Zhang Yimao. These are films by people that he knew who have grew up around the same time as him, experienced some of the same events, and they, they, are, they are his contemporaries. And so I would encourage you to check out um, any of these films uh, that I'm showing in this lecture if you are at all interested in learning more about this moment in Chinese film history where filmmakers who came of age in the Cultural Revolution are reflecting that experience back into their films. Usually not directly. Farewell, My Concubine is actually a bit of an exception in the sense that it actually has scenes taking place in the Cultural Revolution, directly dramatizing that period of history. But in films like The Horse Thief, uh, it's much more indirectly expressed through this vaguely sort of nostalgic, but not really, depiction of the old world, the old China before the communists. And this is also, of course, what you see in Zhang Yimao's films, this kind of return to the sort of what we think of as like the classic kind of per classical period of China, 
uh, the mythological kind of moment where really skilled swordsmen and archers uh, do battle with one another. This is, is Zhang Yimao's bread and butter. And if you ever dive into a world cinema class, you will go into a lot more depth about how, for example, this vision of Chinese history, even though it's these films are set in like the 15, 1600s, like long before uh, communism comes on the scene, uh, you will you will find out how these films are very much a product of that complicated process uh, of coming to terms with China's complicated past. You know, its history as this great world power, its more recent history as commun of, as a communist nation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's your down and dirty introduction to Zhang Yimou. Um, and just to make things as explicit and as clear as possible. Part of the reason I like to talk about random ass movies in these uh, lectures is to encourage you to seek out some alternative uh, films, some additional films that are not on the syllabus that we don't have time to watch as a class. I'm, st I'm putting these on your radar because I want you to come and talk to me about them. I want you to shoot me an email or come to office hours as a few, uh, a few of you have already done and tell me about some of the movies that you might be watching outside of this class. This is what it's all about. It's all about just having conversations about, about film as best we can. So now that uh, you have your down and dirty uh, introduction to Zhang Yimou and the fifth generation uh, school of Chinese filmmakers to which he uh, belongs, we can turn our attention to some more of the nitty gritty uh, things that I want you to be attentive to in the reading. So this is your moment to pause the lecture and just think to yourself and jot down in your notes or go back to the reading if you have it right next to you and just identify a few broad elements of photography that can be manipulated by cinematographers. And part of the reason you want to do this is because uh, the more that you can identify these terms, the more that you can use them and kind of put them into your brains, the easier it'll be for you to remember the fine grain distinction, say, between a close-up and a medium close-up. Here are uh, three broad categories uh, for some of the things we can say about the photographic image. And if you are looking at your list of, of terms from the cinematography chapter, and believe me, there are a lot of bolded, italicized vocab terms in this photography chapter. It is, it is crazy how many like different vocab terms Boardwell and Thompson can find for the different parts of a camera and the different things cinematographers can do with cameras to manipulate the image. But to try to like keep this as organized as possible, we're going to kind of group these into uh, a couple of different categories. And these are the categories, as you, as you will know from having read uh, the book recently, these are the categories that Boardwell and Thompson use to keep it all straight. So we're going to be following along their organization um, as much as we can. But as always, I'm not going to be telling you every last thing that you need to know about tonalities or speeds of motion or uh, like filters on lenses and so on and so forth. This is more your, your roadmap for you to go back to the book and really kind of dive deep into some of the stuff that we're only really going to be kind of brushing um, past Again, because I'm after the roadmap right here with this lecture, not about giving the exhaustive uh, play-by-play, -play, so to speak. So just heads up, translation, uh, read the textbook. It's, it's pretty great. So tonalities. Uh, tonalities are um, a f the first really big, important uh, category of cinematography like you know like broad kind of grouping for things cinematographers can do to affect the quality of the image and you'll find each of these terms uh broken down in far more depth and detail in boardwell thompson so i'm not going to give you the definitions or uh, a lot of examples right now 
Instead, what I want to do is to just give you a sense of what kinds of questions you should be asking yourself as you are watching movies, like what kinds of things you should be thinking about in relation to cinematography using these, uh, these terms and concepts as a guide. So exposures, um, the question that you should be asking yourself when I or your TAs are asking, how would you describe the exposures in, uh, in this particular shot or scene? You're looking for a range that on the one hand has very uh, underexposed, that should say underexposed, not underscored, underexposed, meaning very, very little light is being let into the camera, or the opposite, overexposed, where it's nothing but light being let into the camera. So that's the first thing you want to be asking uh, when somebody says tonalities. What does that mean? Uh, the second thing that you want to be thinking about when somebody says, what's the tonality, uh, what's going on with the tones uh, in this scene, is you want to think about the contrast of the image. Is it a high contrast image, meaning that there's like dark spots in the image and really, really bright spots? Like So there's a huge contrast between those two things. Is it low contrast, meaning that it's kind of a uniform looking image throughout? Or is it fluctuate? Is it something in between those two extremes? Um, just a couple of images uh, to help make this clear. And again, I'm not going to you know, go too exhaustive here because Boardwell and Thompson have provided you with nothing but uh, images from, from films, some of which you may have seen, some of which you may not have seen. But... I couldn't help but leave this slide in uh, the lecture because you see two different tonalities in two seemingly uh, similar shots from different points in the same movie. So this is Neil Jordan's film, The Brave One, which is not a film that is generally talked about or remembered, but is in fact quite good. Uh, I saw it for the first time when I was 18, uh, taking, you know, taking my very first college film class, and it was in theaters like that October, fall uh, semester, freshman year for me. So maybe I'm just, this is my weird way of identifying with you all uh, as many of you being college freshmen through the medium of the computer screen. But beyond, beyond that, beyond that, I, I left this in here because this, you see at the top, it's an underexposed image with high contrast, meaning that there is not a lot of light being let into the camera when they're filming this night scene. And so everything seems really dark and indistinct, even more so than normal, uh, because even though this is a night scene, like they could have l opened that aperture on the camera way bigger and let in way more light and gotten way more detail. But they've cranked down that aperture, letting in very, very little light. And that's why those buildings behind Jodie Foster seem so dark and indistinct. It's because there's not a lot of light being let into the camera to register those images on screen. But here's the thing, it results in a very high contrast image because as you see, there is a lot of dark in this image but there is one part of the image that is not dark. It's very, very bright. It's Jodie Foster. And so you have actually a really like underexposed, uh, underexposures are being used basically to create this high contrast effect, this sort of tension between dark and light, which helps create a menacing vibe for this menacing night scene. At another point in the film, they've used the exact opposite strategy. They've like way opened up that aperture on the camera to let in as much light as they possibly can. And what has happened is so much light is being let in that you're getting this blinding kind of effect. Like that's the sky was very, in all likelihood, a very normal shade of blue the day they shot the scene. But because they've let in so much light, it just seems to be completely white. And as a result of that overexposed, blinding white light kind of being let into the camera and exposed onto the film, you actually don't have a lot of contrast in this image. There's not huge tension between the light areas of the, 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 the frame and darker areas. There is, of course, some contrast. It's not completely white. But the contrast is very minimal. It's much lower than compared to uh, the first images on the top. 
So again, Bordwell Thompson have many, many examples uh, from films that you may or may not have seen. So, so check out their examples and you'll see the various ranges of exposure and contrast that filmmakers have used over the years. When you uh, get to watching or return to watching Raise the Red Lantern, depending on uh, what order you are uh, using these, these video lectures and you're learning, you will see uh, the same kind of thing happening as in the Brave One. You see the same, you see different exposures and contrasts being used over the course of the film to create different moods and feelings in uh, the image and, and consequently in you, the viewer. So take a moment to just look at these images. I've tried to select images that are mostly uh, showing you the same thing, although the one in the bottom right is a different shot. It's not of the, uh, the bedroom uh, as these other three shots are. And just look at these images and see if you can use the terms that we have been describing thus far to uh, overexposure and contrast to describe what you are seeing in these images. Pause the video for sure if uh, you need some time, but just take a moment while you are using this lecture to just see if you can put some labels on, on each of these images in your head. So now I'm going to tell you uh, the answers. So if you're still thinking, you should totally pause and uh, not spoil it for yourself. But um, what you're seeing on the top left is as close to a mid-range exposure and a mid-range sense of contrast as you really get in Raise the Red Lantern. Not overexposed, not underexposed. Uh, there's not a lot of contrast between uh, lights and darks, but there's also like enough contrast uh, that you're 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 noticing contrast. So that's a that's a kind of a you can think of that image on the top left from very early in the film as kind of a default, uh, a default image for like that's a mid exposure, that's a middle of the road exposure, that's right in the middle of the spectrum of contrast. Now look over at the right image, you see what they have done is they have overexposed the image ever so slightly. And the way that you can tell that they have overexposed the image ever so slightly is if you look at the lights, you should be seeing that glow kind of effect. It doesn't totally come across uh, in a still image. But when you look at the scene in the film, you see how the lights, the lanterns themselves, are really popping. Like there's a there's that kind of luminescent glow coming from them, and it is ever so slightly kind of blinding. Now they've gotten that effect by opening up the aperture, the thing on the camera lens that allows light into uh, the camera and onto the film, and they've opened that up just ever so slightly because they are trying to make those red lights, which would be very bright and overwhelming in real life, seem that much more luminescent. And one of the effects of doing that is it does introduce a certain amount of contrast into the image. There's not a lot of contrast compared to some of the images uh, that we'll be talking about momentarily, but there is some contrast between the brightest point in the image, which is, to my eyes, uh, the, the lamps that are in the bed. Like, that's the brightest point in the image. It's like pure white at the center of those, of those shots, or of those, uh, those bulbs. And then the dark kind of corners of the frame, uh, kind of close to where the desk is in the bottom left-hand corner of the shot, the mirror, like, there is a fair degree of contrast between uh, those really, really light kind of spots in the light and those dark spots uh, kind of around the edges of the frame. Um, moving to image number three, the one on the bottom left, what you see there is how low contrast, if image number two is high contrast, uh, overexposed image, what you see um, below is a high contrast underexposed image. Because as you can see, there's quite a lot of contrast between the darkest 
places in the shot, which are all the shadowy things kind of around Song Lian. And the very, very uh, light kind of moments, parts of the frame where you can actually see like figures and you can kind of see light, moonlight reflecting on the sides of the wall. Like there is, there is still contrast happening between those two points in the image. But unlike image number two, this is an underexposed image. They have like, instead of opening the aperture up to let in as much light as they possibly can, they have closed it down so that there's not a lot of light being let into the camera and onto the film. Um, And it creates this like really kind of, it helps intensify the darkness is basically what it does. Uh, and then on the uh, the bottom right, um, that is another example of how the filmmakers are using high, like un- overexposed lighting in kind of a, a, a tricky way. Because you look at that image, you think maybe they have used like they've underexposed, they've underexposed the uh, the image to make it darker. And you would be forgiven for thinking that because uh, it is a very, very dark image and there's not a lot of light being let in. But if you look at those lamps again and you see how bright they are and you see how far away they are from the camera, that's actually, that's your cue that this is an overexposed image because if they had not cranked that aperture or opened that aperture up really wide to allow a lot of light into the camera and onto the film, then those lamps that are really like impossible to miss when you're watching the scene play out, even though they're very far away from the camera, those lamps would not have popped out that way if they had not opened up the aperture really, really wide to allow a lot of light into the camera. So I'm harping on this and kind of really go like talking it through. Um, because I want you to sh- see that one, it's not like a mathematical formula where every single time you're using uh, overexposure, you're going to be producing uh, a high contrast image or vice versa. It's not like every time you see a dark shadowy image, that means it's, it's underexposed. It's, it's, it's a little trickier than that. And the way that you you figure it out is you look at the lights. You look at like the lights in the scene and you see how bright and luminescent and how much white is kind of getting into those lights. That is nine times out of 10, the best way to tell if you're looking at an image that has been overexposed or underexposed or somewhere in between. And then contrast is much easier. You're just looking for uh, the you're looking for the lightest point on the frame and the darkest point on the frame. And you're trying to describe, is there a lot of contrast between those two points or is it more or less even? So again, my advice uh, with your own time and uh, in discussion sections and even in office hours with, with me, uh, Dr. Dan, uh, just talk through the examples, you know, see, see if you can kind of get familiar with the fine art of distinguishing high contrast, low contrast, overexposed, underexposed. Another thing that you will want to think about uh, when we ask you to discuss or describe the tones or the tonalities in a particular moment in a film is whether or not the filmmakers have used any filters and you want to be asking like okay like have has anything been put over the camera like a gauzy thing uh you know plate of glass in some cases uh wire mesh you know in a, in a few instances i could i could tell you about has anything been put over the camera to change the quality of the light that gets into the camera and onto that strip of film. Again, Bordwell Thompson have wonderful examples in their book, but uh, I think that these two images will help clarify uh, sort of just in a down and dirty way what 
like filtered versus unfiltered light looks like. So look at uh, Marlena Dietrich on the left. This is a uh, Shanghai Express, uh, one of Joseph von Sternberg's most famous films. Uh, cinematography by James Wong Howe. It's like a very, very important uh, Asian American cinematographer, like one of the like mo arguably most uh, renowned and respected uh, cinematographers of the classical Hollywood period. But they are both, they're doing two things. One, they are overexposing the image so that a lot of extra light can be kind of sh shined onto uh, Marlena Dietrich's face. And you can tell that they're overexposing the image because if you look at her forehead and you see how white that is, how shiny and luminescent that is. That's, that's again, that's a, a, a subtle clue that they've opened up that aperture and more light is getting put onto film than would be the case if they hadn't done that. But that's, so that's one thing that they're doing to this image to kind of create this luminescent, angelic vibe that I'm sure you're noticing just looking at uh, Marlena Dietrich's uh, immortal face right here. But the other thing that they're doing is they're putting a filter on that camera. And the way that you can tell that they're using a filter is that if you really kind of look at her face, like you are seeing very, very kind of like soft edges uh, where, between, for example, her forehead and uh, her hair, between her hair and the background. Um, you're seeing this very kind of soft kind of like you're seeing very soft edges, for example, like on her cheekbones. You see there's some shadows where her fingers are near her cigarette. Like those shadows shade into the white spart parts very gradually, uh, very, very kind of imperceptibly. It's very soft transition between light and dark. And that is a strong, strong cue that they have used filters to just to just prevent every last little ray or beam of light from getting onto the camera. And it creates a bit of a hazier kind of image. Now contrast that to um, this shot of Maria Falconetti and Carl Dreyer's uh, really incredible film, The Passionate Joan of Arc, cinematography by Rudolf Maté. Um, famously, they use no filters in this film. This is famously a film where uh, the goal was to have it be as close to real documentary reality as possible. So there was no filters being used on this image. And if you look at the shadows uh, on Falconetti's face, you'll see that the shifts from shadows to light areas are much uh, sharper. They're not totally like very, they're not like contrasty or anything, but there's a sharper transition between uh, dark and light areas uh, on her face. If you look at her forehead and on her cheeks, you can see how the light is really kind of illuminating virtually every little um, pockmark or line on her face. And it's just like you're just picking up way more detail in this image because nothing is kind of getting between you, the actress, and the lights that they're using on set. Like there's no filter being used to hide some of this stuff or sort of soften it out. It's just, it's, it's an unadorned shot of this woman at a moment of extreme emotional uh, distress. And as I'm talking about this, I'm hoping that you're starting to sort of see uh, the emotional value of using these different strategies because in Shanghai Express, the image on the left, that is a very lush and glamorous film. And so the filters help create this unworldly angelic atmosphere in which the film takes place whereas by contrast the passion of joan of arc is a very serious intense drama about joan of arc and the uh the last few days of her life and the unfiltered light helps create this sense of raw immediacy and reality that really locks you into identifying with this character who died hundreds of years before any of us were born. So they have very different emotional effects and the really good filmmakers are extremely aware of how much difference filtered versus unfiltered light can kind of make for the emotions of your scene. And they're thinking about these things. So if that's you, if you're a filmmaker, if you've made movies or want to make movies, you know, filters are your friends. 
and they're wonderful because you don't really need super fancy filters. You can you can you can filter. You can use gauzy curtains in your house as a filter. Like people have done that in Hollywood productions, and they still do that like all the time. So yeah, uh, try it out sometime. Try putting some stuff over your iPhones or your cameras. Use, of course, the filters that come with them, but like try putting some actual stuff in front of the lens and just see what happens. I think it's, you'll be surprised at uh, how much of a difference some of these things can make for the quality of your images. Tinted and untinted. This is a uh, different but seemingly related thing, which is uh, why I want to go over it real quick because it can be confusing. But tinting and not tinting is seemingly the same as filters because in both cases you're talking about something that is put onto the image to affect the quality of, of the light. The difference between an untinted image and a tinted image with respect to uh, filters is that this tinting is happening in post-production. Like the filter is something that happens in production when the film is being made, the cameraman and the cinematographer uh, confer and they decide let's put a filter on the lens for the scene. Tinting is happening after the fact. It's, it's something that happens after the movie has been shot and in some cases after the film has been edited. The director of photography and the director at that point will go back to the film and they will look at it and they will sometimes say, you know, we should retroactively add some tinting to this scene to intensify the light that was already there. So in most of the time that you see this now, it's not nearly as dramatic as this moment from A Trip to the Moon, which uh, is a film you all should see and re-see and watch over and over again. If, if it's, it's so great. But this is being done like this is probably the most dramatic version of tinting that you'll ever see. And you rarely, rarely see tinting being done on this kind of tense scale where every single shot in the film is being completely kind of colored over in this way. But you will still see in Hollywood films uh, this kind of thing happening where after the film has been made, after it's been edited, before it's released, the director sits down with the director of photography and they time, they, they color time the movie. They go back through scenes. A lot of the times they're just trying to smooth things out, trying to make sure that shots that may have been shot several days apart in different kinds of weather line up and cut together. Sometimes it's for emotional effect to add more light or to add more shadows to a scene where they may not have existed. Uh, the possibilities are endless, and computers have certainly made this kind of thing, which in 1902 would have taken a lot of hours of hand dyeing and hand stenciling colors onto films, individual strips of film. A lot of this can be done with computers now. But the big thing is tinting is after the fact, whereas filters are before the fact in production. So it's the difference between production and post-production, tinting and filters. You're not seeing a lot of tinting in Raise the Red Lantern, but you do see a lot of filters um, used at different points in the film to create different kinds of light. So as before, uh, the top left image, so the very, very first shot of the film, the very masterful first shot of the movie, where uh, if you're anything like me, you see this moment in the movie and you're like, this is a really bold opening. This is a really, really, uh, this is going to be an interesting film. But what's, what's really great about going back to it after having seen the film uh, once or, or more than once, as the case may be for some of you, um, you notice that it's, it's, again, they're giving you kind of a default kind of image. Like this is an unfiltered image. You know, the first time that you see this character, they, they aren't using any filters. They're not really doing anything to dramatically alter the quality of the light that is being used on set. So you're getting something that is closer uh, in many senses to the image of Rene Falconetti uh, in Passion of Joan of Arc than it is to the image of Marlena Dietrich in Shanghai Express. And again, there's a narrative reason for doing this. Like the narrative reason for doing this is that we need to have an unvarnished look at this character 
to have the strong emotional connection with her that I know many of us are feeling as we watch this film. And so the, this, this, the decision not to use a filter in this very, very important first shot of the movie has been made to give you the best possible first look at this character, to really see who she is. And, you know, it's one of the things that allows that really masterful moment with the tear kind of streaming down her cheek to really uh, register both on a literal level of you can actually see it because they have not used a filter and it makes it easier to pick up small stuff like that when there's no filter being used. But it also allows you to really kind of connect with her. You feel very intimately connected to this character the first time you see her because of how they have chosen to frame and light these shots. As you move through the film, particularly in the middle section of the film, you see a lot more filters being used to soften the quality of the light on Song Lian's face. And sometimes these filters are being used uh, in camera. So the image on the top right, which it comes from a, the second main sequence in the film where she's, she's in the house, she's met the master. This is after they've slept together for the first time. And they are using a filter on this shot to create this kind of soft edges. And it doesn't really come through quite as much when you look at Song Lian's face as it does in the previous images from the uh, the black and white films. But if you look kind of in the background and you see just kind of how soft the uh, transitions are uh, between the different parts of the wall behind her, that's that's your, your, your subtle tell that they have used a filter on this shot to kind of help soften out the quality of that red light, create this kind of luminescent sort of glow that effectively transforms the character into a visual object for uh, the master's desire. It's like that's effectively what they're doing is they are helping to show you how she is seen by the other characters in the film by using a filter to create this luminescent kind of soft diffused quality to the light that you're seeing there. An even more pronounced example uh, of filters being used in the film though comes a little later like about halfway through the movie and this is a good example of how sometimes the, you can actually see the filters in the space of the scene so here you know that curtain is part of the mise-en-scene in the bottom uh, left image that's that's something that's in the reality of the scene if there is a question on the test that says what is that that's that's mise-en-scene that's an element of mise-en-scene but it's doing double duty. Like it's that curtain is both an element of mise en scene, but it's also doing the work of cinematography. It's helping to diffuse the light in the scene and create this effect of softness. These really kind of soft edges between uh, light areas in the frame and shadows. And it's doing that because what you are meant to be seeing at this point in the film is you are meant to be seeing how the very things in the world of the movie that are turning Song Lian into, or making her this beautiful mistress, this concubine for the master's pleasure. Like you can, you can, you are allowed to see how the things that are making her into this beautiful sex object in the film are, absolutely 100% trapping her in this unhappy life that will, by the end of the film, as you, as you will see, uh, lead to some not so good outcomes for the characters in this movie. So this is a good example. I'm highlighting this bottom third image because it's a good example about how the relationship between cinematography and mise-en-scene is actually uh, quite fluid and there is a lot of interplay between the work that the art director does to build that set and find those curtains and make sure that they match with other elements of the scene. That, that work has to happen in conversation with what the cinematographer is doing with lights. So you can bet that the cinematographer and the art director on this film were both meeting with Zhang Yimao very frequently to be on the same page, to make sure that that curtain 
would work for the art direction of the scene while also ensuring that it would create this soft kind of luminescent light. Because again, the point of this shot and indeed the point of the film is to allow you to see both things happening at the same time, to allow you to see her as a character being transformed into a sex object, a visual object of desire for the master to uh, sleep with or look at or just kind of put away in the corner and, until he's until he's interested again. Like you're allowed to see how this whole process is trapping her in a life that she does not want and did not choose. And again, the film says this in dialogue, but like it's so powerful to have it be reinforced in an unspoken way through visual uh, through visual cues in mise en scène and cinematography. But anyway, that's an example of a filter being found in the mise en scène, uh, as opposed to a filter that we don't see as an element of mise en scène, but is still being slapped onto the camera to change the quality of the light. And then the fourth image on the bottom right is you return in the late portions of the film to an unfiltered image. They have returned at this point to framing her in this harsh, direct light that is not mediated or filtered by anything kind of in front of the camera. And they're doing that to create this this sense of like kind of this almost like splashing cold water in your face kind of effect of like she is at this point in the film been rebuffed by the master. She's been cast out. She's been ostracized. And taking away the filter shows you how she is no longer seen by the master as the most beautiful and desirable wife. She's just another person, another person who lives in this house. She's, she does her thing. She's nobody. And using this filter uh, is a unspoken, or taking the filter off the camera in this last moment is an unspoken, subtle way the filmmakers are reinforcing that she is no longer uh, seen as special in the master's eyes. And the really powerful thing about these moments in the film is that by the time you get here, this character is so used to seeing herself at this point in the movie, the way the master has has constructed her she has so thoroughly come to identify with her identity and status as the fourth mistress of the house that she feels as like this is almost a reflection of her own uh, emotions as much as anything she feels there's a way that you know not using the filter reinforces how the character is emotionally quite naked and distraught in these final moments of the film feels abandoned alone, et cetera, et cetera. So you see what I'm after here. Like what, if, uh, like what we're basically just going for is when you're looking for these devices, you want to be thinking about like, oh, is this filtered, unfiltered? But like more importantly, you want to be doing a version of what I'm doing right now, which is talk through the story thematic implications of the device. Like because there's no formula, there's no sort of, secret rule book that says you know filters do this always 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 and unfiltered thing images convey this it's 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 so variable it's so dependent on the film and the way that you're really going to start seeing how uh the magic of cinema if i can just use that term for a minute is by asking yourself and sort of talking through this device at this moment in the film is an appropriate choice because it tells me X, Y, or Z about the char- the character. Uh, so you'll see a version of that play out uh, in the next few slides when we talk about some more terms that you should uh, you should you should study up on. Um, but moving right along to lens length and depth of field, again, a um, lot of variations and stuff that you can kind of dive into in the book with with all of the different focal lengths and depths of field options that exist. The overall questions that you want to be asking yourself, though, when somebody says, talk about the lens length and depth of field in this image are... 
Are you using, uh, are you seeing a wide angle lens, a normal lens, a telephoto lens? Like what, like are you seeing a lot of compression or expansion of space? And for depth of field is like, are you seeing, are you seeing a lot of clarity in the background? Are you seeing that they have f set up the camera in such a way that everything is really, really clear from foreground to back like it is in Citizen Kane? Or do you look at the background and just see a lot of fuzzy, indistinct stuff? So again, a couple of examples just to uh, underline uh, some of these options and make it a little more concrete. Again, book has so many more. Check the book. Book's got great examples, not to keep repeating myself, but the book is your friend in this chapter more so than normal. Um, but I've chosen a couple of images uh, from Sidney Lumet films for this slide because, uh, one, he's an amazing filmmaker. You may remember uh, I include a quote from him uh, in our very, very first uh, slideshow about what is film form. So he's he's my artistic hero if you wanna if you if you want the honest truth, but I've chosen his these images because they show the range of different lenses that can be used even within the course of the same scene from the same film. Because it's not just it's usually not like oh we're gonna stick with the same exact lens from start to finish. Like sometimes filmmakers do that. Sometimes films are shot using only one lens. But most of the time, filmmakers are strategically varying the kinds of lenses that they're using in order to produce different effects from shot to shot. So if you look at the, uh, the top left image from Failsafe, uh, a really, really relevant, uh, important film that just came out in a fancy new Blu-ray from Criterion. So check that out if you get a chance. But the top image, you have a wide angle lens. And the way that you know it's a wide angle lens is because that phone seems to be really kind of bulging out at you, the viewer. And the reason that that phone seems to be kind of bulging out at you in the viewer in relation, especially to the, the normal lens image below it, is because that wide angle lens is so wide that it, 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 it's photographing like way more space than a normal lens or a telephoto lens. And the only way it can kind of fit all of that stuff into the image is by, it creates this kind of bulbous, bulbing kind of effect. Uh, you'll see another example of this uh, in a moment in my next slide, but it's also, of course, many examples in the book. But the big thing there is that the, the wide angle lens relative to the normal lens is pulling whatever whatever's in front of it kind of forward creating this kind of bulbing sort of effect by contrast the telephoto lens which you can see the telephoto lens uh in the bottom right image um in, from 12 angry men that compresses space like that the thing that the telephoto lens does is it compresses space so if you look at henry fonda relative to the thing, the wall behind him. That wall is in reality about a good five or six feet away from Henry Fonda. Like, in, if you look at like the set, like, like look at the the image above it. That's a normal lens. Like that wall is actually quite distant from him. Like it's not. It's a small room in Twelve Angry Men that they're hanging out in, but it's not that small. But the telephoto lens uh, pulls the walls in on top of the characters and it flattens and compresses that space. And as I'm talking through these images, what I'm hoping that you're thinking about is, okay, yeah, well and good, the technical stuff is, is fine, but I'm hoping that you're noticing how the emotional impact of these lenses is very, very different when you are comparing a wide angle lens to a telephoto lens to a normal lens. In the wide angle lens from Failsafe, for example, the emotion of that lens is very much one of underlining the extreme outsized importance that this telephone has for the Henry Fonda character. Like the wide angle lens doesn't just make it look kind of like bulbous and sort of pull it forward and, and make it look kind of weird. It's doing that to emphasize how this object is taking up so much of this character's 
like field of vision, both like like literally, like it's all he's looking at, but it's also suggesting his mental sort of connection to this telephone. Like he really, really is just, this is going to be his life for the next uh, portion of the movie. The telephoto lens, uh, by contrast, it creates this claustrophobic uh, kind of vibe that really resonates with what's happening in the film at this point where the characters are really heated and angry and yelling at each other and the claustrophobic telephoto lens is absolutely appropriate for that emotion that they're going for. A couple of other examples from just other things that will hopefully make this a little more clear if it's still a little, uh, you're still trying to get it straight. Uh, This is your classic example of a wide-angle lens. And you can see there's an image of a wide-angle lens on the bottom left of the screen. And you can see how wide that lens is, uh, especially compared to the telephoto lens I'm going to show you next. And because that lens is so wide, because it is literally built to let in more stuff than a normal lens... That's where you're getting this bulbing kind of effect that you're seeing in the buildings. So you see how the buildings are like curved and they seem to be kind of just again like the the thing that is immediately in front of the camera, which in this case is the Chicago sign. Like that is kind of being pulled forward and the things kind of on the periphery of the image are kind of being warped. And this is, this, is, this is the way you know you're looking at a, tel- uh, a wide-angle lens, is if you see kind of this bulbing effect uh, that comes from using this lens that is literally designed to let in as many different things as you put in front of it. This is uh, your classic telephoto lens uh, example. And so if you're a sports fan, you are way familiar with what a telephoto lens is because this is like 95% of the time what sports photographers use to get photos and visual images of people playing sports. Because you can see the guy on the right, like he's not actually on the field. He's kind of between the field and the spectators. And the action is happening, you know, kind of far away from him. So what sports photographers use to make that action visible is they use the telephoto lens, which as you can see is like this telescope basically. Like you can think of it that way. It's like the telescope lens. And it lets them see things really clearly that may be, uh, you know, hundreds of feet away, but it does so at the cost of pulling the background way close to the foreground and rendering it virtually, uh, you know, indistinct. So when you're looking for a telephoto lens, you're looking for something that could be visually similar to like a sports shot. You know, a shot where the background seems to be way closer to the foreground than it actually would appear in real life. That background is probably a couple hundred feet from the pitcher in this shot, but it seems like it's right on top of them. And the other thing that you know, the way you know that this is a, uh, a telephoto lens is because in addition to having the background seem very close to him when it's actually quite far from him, uh, it's very, very blurry and indistinct. Um, sometimes you will have blurry and indistinct backgrounds and not have it be a telephoto lens, so you need to, to be having both together. But if you are seeing a background that is, as the, uh, the adage in the uh, driver's side mirror says, is way closer than it actually appears in real life, then, and it's really blurry, then you're, you're, you're almost certainly looking at a telephoto lens. A couple of examples um, from Raise the Red Lantern, and these are not as dramatic as the previous two examples of Chicago and the sports, uh, the sports photography. But I want you to still take a look very carefully at these images and see if you notice the differences in lenses that are being used. 
because the range of different lenses is not super wide, but they are very distinctively using wide angle lenses, normal lenses, and telephoto lenses at different points throughout this film. So if you look at the top image, for example, like that is a wide angle lens and it's not as dramatic as the wide angle lens uh, that we saw for the Chicago images a moment ago. But it is a wide angle lens because what you're seeing, if you look at the edges of the frame, you are seeing ever so slightly a distortion in perspective. If you look at like the, the buildings on the house uh, and the, the shingles on the house, and if you look on the, the, the very right side of the frame with those, those poles, you can kind of see that the objects that are actually closest to the frame, uh, to the camera physically are being pulled forward ever so slightly and that things that are farther away are being ever so slightly distorted and kind of rendered a little bit bulbous. It is very, very subtle in this image. It's not nearly as pronounced as it was in Raise the Red Lantern, or rather as the images of Chicago, but it's, it's nonetheless there. And it's there to help make the space of the house seem ever so slightly disorienting to Song Lian, the character, and to you, the viewer. You are meant to share her subtle feeling of there's something not quite right about this place, but I can't quite put my finger on it just yet through the decision to use ever so slightly the wide angle lens. Um, very down at the bottom, you're seeing a, a telephoto lens. Um, and you can tell that that's a telephoto lens because if you compare that to the normal lens, which is representing a similar, if not identical space, you can see that there seems to be way more space between door number one and door number two in the normal image. Like you can look, look at the space kind of on the floor leading through the doors to the two characters who are framed perfectly center. Like there's actually, it seems like there's a fair amount of space between those doors. In the telephoto version of this, of this image, uh, there does not appear to be nearly as much space between the doors and the floor. It seems to be flatter, comparatively speaking, uh, than the normal, the normal lens image uh, of the same space. And again, the effect is not necessarily meant to be as pronounced as in the sports photography example, but it is there to subtly and imperceptibly disorient you, to unsettle your certainty about how the space of this house is laid out so that you can be more fully sharing Song Lian's disorientation and confusion uh, throughout the film. Okay, so that is your, your cheat sheet for photographic elements of cinematography as applied to some select moments from Raise the Red Lantern. So that's big thing number one to know about cinematography is the photographic elements. The big thing number two to know about cinematography is elements of framing. So take a moment, pause the video, and just list as many elements of framing that cinematographers can manipulate that you can remember from doing the reading or even that you remember from other contexts. So Bordwell and Thompson uh, group the various vocab terms that you are listing, thinking about, and or have encountered into a couple of broad categories. And as before, I'm not gonna go into every single element or term that they mention in great depth, but I do wanna give you a, a broad overview of some of these, these things to think about with respect to framing so that you have a better sense of where to go when you return to the reading and when you look at the film or relook at the film as the case may be. Frame dimensions and shape. This may seem like an obvious one, but it is always worth pointing out the obvious stuff because, at least in this instance, 
what it underscores is just how many different things that you don't necessarily even think about uh, as being part of the cinematographer's job have an impact on the image. So aspect ratio. I think for many of us, most of the time, when we look at a film, we don't notice the aspect ratio or we notice it for like 30 seconds and then move on. We're like, oh, it's a square. It's, you know, it's an old TV show or an old movie. Or, oh, it's super widescreen. Or it's middle widescreen, 166. Um, and then there's all these other aspect ratios, all these slight variations on, you know, Cinemarama versus Anamorphic 235, you know, all this stuff. And it seems obvious. It seems overly technical. But I'm starting with frame dimensions and shape because it's it, it it matters. I mean, when you have a square, uh, you are going to be using different compositions, different lights, different sets, even in some cases, than when you have uh, a two seven seven cinerama. Um, and similarly, I mean, the difference between one six six European widescreen and one eight five American widescreen. I mean, that's that's not a huge difference. But man, like, don't tell some of those European filmmakers that they have to cut their one six six image to a one eight five for for American widescreen. They'll 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 flip their shit. Like they'll you know because because it matters. I mean, it has every it has it impacts everything from composition, most obviously, to lights and sets, less obviously. Uh, so don't don't neglect frame dimensions and shape, even though it's something that is very easy to kind of let slip into the background and not notice. Um, again, like, you know, you will see filmmakers, uh, not usually as directly as Martin Scorsese is currently doing in this, uh, shot from the departed, but like, you will see people play with these frame dimensions and shapes, uh, all the time. Like, especially in, uh, the independent film scene, you will see things like this happen on a regular basis. Like people kind of varying, uh, the aspect ratio or using unconventional aspect ratios for, uh, one scene, or even in some cases, an entire film. Uh, it's, it's, it, it makes a difference. Camera position. Camera position is, one of the things that immediately comes to mind for a lot of folks when you think about cinematography, and I'm sure that at the beginning of this lecture, some folks were thinking, oh yeah, low angle, high angle, like, you know, uh, long shot close up for uh, elements of cinematography. And it's definitely right to do that. It's a huge, huge, hugely important responsibility that the cinematographer has in partnership with the director is figuring out where to put the camera. Um, and some, so for some many filmmakers, this is like literally the first thing that they do when they get to the set in the morning. They talk to the cinematographer about where to put the camera. And in a lot of cases, that's a conversation that has already happened over and over again the night before, the week before, a month before, like constantly having conversations about where to put the camera because it has it has an impact on everything else if you know you're going to be using a, a close-up from a particular angle you can you can build a set just for that shot or if you're going to be using a long shot for for that angle you build you can build a set for that shot for that long shot um, and you got to know ahead of time which one you're going to use because otherwise you're not going to build the set that you need right so camera angles, uh, camera angle height, do you have it as a high angle, a low angle? Do you put it straight on? Do you go close? Do you go far? Do you go somewhere in between? Where is the camera? That's, that's what you think about when we say camera position. Like, where have they put that camera? Nothing too crazy here, but another, another few shots from The Passion of Joan of Arc, that movie I showed uh, earlier in the slideshow. Um, just to give you a quick down and dirty illustration of the differences between uh, level medium shots, for example, a shot that is like a straight on looking right at the actor from a medium distance versus a, in the second image, a close-up that is a, a shot that is straight on looking at this character from an, 
from a level perspective, but the camera is much closer. And then the bottom you have, uh, you have your low angle extreme close up, closer even than the first close up, lower, uh, the camera is lower in relation to the actor than it is in the other shots, looking up at him. So Boardwell Thompson, the textbook, they have like 9 million more of these examples. Um, familiarize yourself with those examples because as you can see, there are quite a lot of gradations between these ranges. And you really, really wanna be familiar with the different possible ways that filmmakers have used, like different possible uh, camera distances and angles. Uh, there will be questions on the quiz and on the test about some of these variations. So you definitely don't want to shortchange uh, all of the myriad camera angles and distances that Boardwell and Thompson have cataloged for you. I'm going to segue here, though, and hopefully give you a better sense of how these things can impact the emotional feeling of a film, like what kinds of impressions you get of a place and of a story through um, decisions about framing. And I'm going to be using my own vacation photos from uh, last summer. Uh, so that was right when we moved to Pittsburgh, my wife and I. And there is a really, really famous uh, movie landmark in Evans City, Pennsylvania, which is about uh, 20, 30 minutes uh, outside of Pittsburgh. Some of you may already know what, what movie I'm talking about, but I'm not going to reveal it just yet. Um, it's a famous film, very, very famous film. So we drove up to this location, my wife and I, and I proceeded to put my, my amateur photography skills to good use. Uh, and what that means is I stood in one place, I turned around a couple times, and I snapped a few photos with my phone. So I'm using, I'm basically filming long shots uh, from a kind of a level perspective. I wasn't really in these, these moments as like bending over or climbing on top of things. I was just standing up, looking straight ahead, snapping a photo of what I saw in the distance, moving on. So here's what I did at the entrance. I didn't take this photo, but it's, uh, it's what you would have seen if you turned around from those previous images. So again, it's another long shot. Uh, the person who took this image did what I did. Just went to this place, looked ahead, shot some stuff. Now the film that is really, really famous uh, that was made in these locations is of course, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, which is uh, a remarkable film. Um, it is absolutely worth seeing if you have not seen it. Um, really, really incredible example of what can be done when talented uh, filmmakers scrape together barely enough money to pay for a camera, go out with their friends and to locations that are easily accessible uh, you know, to them, and then just make a movie. And you can see they didn't have anything really that different from what I did. They went to the same location. You can see in the top left-hand corner, like you can see that thing that I just showed you. It's up at the top of the left-hand corner, that little uh, uh, house, whatever it is. Um, so they, it's not like they have, they've have they done anything to this set, but what they have done is they have varied the camera angle and the camera position. Like you are having a lot of close-ups in these shots. You have the camera being tilted uh, to the left or to the right ever so uh, subtly. You have uh, different levels of depth you have in the image in the bottom left for example you have some trees in the foreground you have the shadowy man in the background like it's a completely different space in george romero's uh hands and with his camera lens than it was in mine and nothing has been done to the sets like they didn't do anything to the sets i didn't do anything to those locations it is the same location but as you can see, the vibe in these images is so, so different uh, than it is in my vacation photos. And that is a testament not only to the power of framing and camera distance, but also, I mean, if you're looking carefully, you see you're seeing uh, different lenses being used. You're seeing telephoto lenses being used in the bottom right image, for example, to flatten out the space and make those graves seem closer to the actors than they might otherwise appear. You're seeing unfiltered light being used in the top right image to create this kind of harsh, 
very, very like hard edged uh, quality to the light that resonates very intensely with the dramatic emotions on display in the scene. Um, all the tricks in the book, you know, they had like $10,000 to make this movie and, you know, like a 16 millimeter camera. And they, they got a scary effect just by being real creative with framing and cinematography. A couple of other examples um, of camera position uh, from films that you have recently seen. Um, Raise the Red Lantern and uh, Citizen Kane. I mean, this is the classic, you know, example of long shots being taken from low angle or a high angle. And I'm showing you these two images partly because I want to get on my soapbox uh, for, for another moment again and just reiterate that there isn't really an established playbook, you know, for what these devices will do for your movie. Um, I know that when I was starting to learn about all of these different terms, it was really be like, oh my goodness, okay, so the low angle shot makes somebody look powerful and intense, and the, the high angle shot makes them look look weak and, and uh, you know, diminutive and all that stuff, right? And sometimes that's true. Sometimes you'll have uh, that exact scenario play out where a low angle shot makes somebody look, you know, very powerful and intense and a high angle shot makes them look very small and weak. But in these two shots, uh, that's not really what's totally going on. Like the top shot is Citizen Kane uh, being framed at a low angle but it's at his weakest moment in the film. And so you have a low angle shot being used in conjunction with uh, putting the actor far away from the camera lens and it creates this effect of weakness and smallness. And in Raise the Red Lantern, you're having a high angle shot that isn't necessarily making those characters look weak and diminutive so much as it's just enclosing them within the space. It's like... They're just, they're, they look like rats in a cage because of the way that high angle shot is framing them. And so I'm, I'm pulling these shots up just, I guess, to illustrate and reiterate that it's not, it's an art and not a science, right? Like, it isn't a question of this is a low angle shot, so it must mean that the character is really strong and powerful. Here is a high angle shot, so it must mean that the, the, we should read these characters in this way. Um, that's not how it works. How it works is you have to read what the filmmaker is doing at that moment in the context of the entire film. And you really just have to ask yourself, like, okay, what point of the film are we? What am I seeing visually? And how, 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 is, that, how is that connected to what's happening in the story? How is the, the visual choices about where to put the camera reinforcing what the dialogue is doing, like telling you more about the characters than the characters are telling you about themselves, telling you more about what the story is about, uh, telling you through, through, through images rather than words, like what the vibe or the effect of the scene is. Right. So, so, so be creative is what I'm saying. Like, it's not, it's not an interpretation, usually a question of this is a right interpretation. This is a wrong interpretation. It's usually a question of how well can you connect your observations about what you're seeing with what you learn from the story and from the dialogue and from watching the movie, like, like how well can you connect what you're seeing to that stuff? How much can you make them resonate with each other? How much can you make right sentences that say the long angle shot from a low angle was the only way they could have filmed the scene because it's the only way they could have gotten this effect of weakness uh, that you're meant to sort of see in Kane right now right it's that kind of thing in the case of raise the red lantern um i really think that when you break it all down these high angle shots these low angle shots uh these wide angle lenses these telephoto lenses like all of the devices that you are seeing in this film are being used to create a sense of disorientation in the viewer. I think one of the reasons, uh, for example, that the film is shifting between so many of these different kinds of shots 
uh, from different angles and using different lenses because it is on a fundamental level trying to get you to share uh, Song Lian's vague sense of disorientation and confusion and unsettled, uncanny feeling that she is experiencing uh, being trapped in this house. So I've selected this quote from Roger Ebert, which I will proceed to read because it really, I think, kind of hits the nail on the head of what is... What is the film's strategy with lenses and uh, with camera angles? So he writes, Although there are many shots of the house's architecture, it is curiously difficult to get a good idea of its extent and layout. It seems to extend in all directions indefinitely, as if expanding in the direction of our gaze. Much of the action takes place on the rooftops, which link in a labyrinth of passageways and stairs, and include an ominous little house where it is said women have died. But in the past, of course. And so Ebert's writing a, a very short review uh, of this film uh, when he's seeing it in 1991 uh, and reviewing it for the Chicago Sun-Times. So he's not doing what Bordwell and Thompson do in the sense that he doesn't have the space or uh, the venue to really go into the technical nitty-gritty. But here is effectively what he's describing. It's a, a series of images from an early sequence. Um, most of these shots uh, come right after uh, one another. It's a very, very short kind of moment early in the film where Song Lian is exploring the house for the first time. And just, I would say, pause the video here and see if you can start to n put labels on some of the cinematic devices that you're being seen used in this scene. So for example, uh, do you see any wide angle lenses being used in the scene? Do you see any lenses, uh, telephoto lenses being used in this scene? What kinds of camera positions do you notice? Like camera angles, uh, Camera, camera distances, um, like where is the camera related in relation to the action? So this, this scene, uh, it does have quite a few different devices being used. You're seeing, uh, for example, in the top left image is, that's a wide angle lens. Like you're seeing a, uh, a wide angle lens being used to accentuate and extend the space of the scene, to kind of show, to show as much of the house as can possibly be squeezed into a single image. And the way that you can tell this is a wide angle lens is if you look at the top, if you look at the right hand corner of that top left hand image, you see how the camera or the lens is pulling forward that, that part of the house. It seems to kind of pull like a little bit closer to the camera. It seems to kind of protrude in our field of view um, more dramatically in that shot than it does in some of these other shots. And conversely, that space kind of around that, like everything else basically in the image, like the space between objects seems to be accentuated and extended. And you can't really see too much of that bulbing effect um, in this image compared to uh, the one of Chicago that I showed you earlier. But it, it, it is ever so slightly there. If you kind of look very, very carefully at the, um, the other kind of things around uh, the frame, you can, see, you can see it kind of bulging and bulbing just ever so slightly. Again, they're not trying to get you to be like, whoa, what a crazy looking space, but they are trying to make it feel ever so slightly off. And they accentuate that effect by cutting from that image to an image just a few moments later where they're using a telephoto lens. So if you look at the bottom left image, you can see how uh, the space between the different roofs seems to be pretty, pretty flat. Like those various parts of those roofs seems to be kind of like right on top of each other. And the reason that that effect is happening is because they are putting that camera very, very, very far away from Gong Li, the actress. And they are using that telephoto lens to really kind of zoom in on her uh, from a very, very far distance away. And one of the consequences of that is it's also flattening the space. 
it's also creating this this sense visually that the space looks different in this shot than it did in the wide angle shot immediately above it even though she's in the same space and like these shots are coming literally like 30 seconds apart so again they're 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 shifting between these different lenses because they're trying to subtly disorient you about how space is laid out in the film and they further uh, contribute to that effect by shifting between long shots, like most of these uh, images are long shots, uh, to close-ups. There are other plenty of close-ups in this scene. They also are varying the angles. Sometimes you are looking at uh, Song Lian from straight on. Sometimes you're looking at her from a lower angle. In the bottom right image, it's ever so slightly a high angle, kind of looking down on her. The, they, are, they are varying, like every time you see the house in a sustained kind of moment like this one, and there are several of them throughout the film, it is remarkable to notice like how much they are varying lens length, uh, depth of field, um, camera position, angle. Like It's remarkable how much those things have been varied from shot to shot. And again, the effect, the purpose in doing that for this particular film is to underline what the narrative and the dialogue is already telling you. This character is confused. She doesn't want to be here. This place seems cold and uninviting. It's easy to get lost. Like, this is all reinforcing things that the dialogue tells you or the film tells you through other means. It's underlining it so that, because this is what films do, you know, they speak visually. So camera movement, I don't have too much to say about camera movement because I do not want to overload uh, this lecture with extra clips to watch. But camera movement is something that Bordwell and Thompson talk about extensively in their chapter, and it is something that we will be revisiting periodically uh, throughout the semester when we look at, for example, Do the Right Thing next week. We'll have a lot of crazy camera movement. But the questions that you want to think about and review uh, when watching a film are two, two options, basically. Panning, tilting, tracking, dolly. So panning, tilting is when a stationary camera, and that's really the key, the key uh, thing to remember. It's a stationary camera either rotating from side to side or uh, rotating up and down. So that's, that's panning, tilting. Tracking dolly is when the camera is literally put on some tracks and rolled through a scene. So it's a question of whether the camera is like standing still um, and being rotated from side to side in panning, tilting, or whether it's being put on some tracks and rolled uh, left, right, forward, backward. And sometimes you can have both at the same time. Sometimes you'll see a tracking shot that is also panning and, t and or tilting. Um, but they are, in fact, two distinct things that cinematographers can do. So review that section of the book. Um, find some examples. Uh, there are plenty of examples of both of these in virtually every film uh, that you might watch. And uh, I have no doubt that you'll be able to find a few go-to examples uh, to kind of keep these, these terms uh, straight. Off-screen space. Uh, this is the last big point to touch on with cinematography because it's kind of like, for me, uh, it's a little bit like frame dimension. Like, it's something we don't always think about as being a choice that cinematographers have to make. But when you really think about it, it kind of becomes impossible to imagine not having a conversation about off-screen space, if you know what I mean. Because off-screen space uh, and the question of what you don't see in a movie is just as important, if not more important, than questions about what you do see in a movie. And you can bet that cinematographers and directors and uh, art directors, in some cases, are having regular conversations about what to not show in their film. 
most obviously this happens a lot in horror films like you know should we show the monster in this in this scene or should we have the monster be off screen um that's that's probably the most common and obvious way that filmmakers will use off screen space for dramatic effect but what i love about raise the red lantern is that you see off screen space being used in a completely different genre to very powerful dramatic effect because you notice that very very often in the film the master is represented off screen now in these two shots he's actually not off screen he's actually on screen um so i'm saying at the outset if you have not yet uh watched raise the red lantern you will actually see the master. Like sometimes reviews of the film uh, and Wikipedia descriptions will erroneously state that he's not in the film. No, he is in the film, but he is never seen all that clearly. And whenever you are introduced to him, it is almost always in the context of one of these very, very long shots. Um, The first one from the early part of the film when you first uh, meet this character And then the second comes from later in the film after the master has started to wise up to some of the things that are happening in his house. And this is 95% of the time how he is represented. And what these long shots do is they prime you to be thinking about the master as a character, not, not so much as a character, but as more of a presence in the house. And so what starts to happen for many viewers when they watch the film whether you're kind of aware of this or not whether you really focused in on this feeling or if this was just part of your viewing experience what happens is that you get these shots these long shots used over and over again and you start to really kind of feel the master's presence in these shots even when he's not in them And partly that's because they are calling back to um, this shot, these shots where you do see him. Like you'll notice that when you do see him, it's almost always in this kind of like frontally kind of composed, very uh, symmetrical compositions. He's often on the side of the composition or in the bottom image dead center. You can't really see him. You're noticing his relationship to the space of the scene more so than you're noticing him when he is on screen. And so all you have to do to get your audience to think about this character when not showing him, just keep the same composition. Keep the same camera angle, the same perspective, the same kinds of lighting. Just take out the master. And because he's been so thoroughly associated with these kinds of shots, when we come back to him, we just we, we feel him there even when he's not there. And this is the really uh, powerful thing that this film does to kind of put you into this character's perspective. So in addition to using a variety of different lenses and filters and camera angles to disorient you about the layout of the space and to change Song Lien from uh, an ordinary girl to a sex doll to an ordinary girl again. Uh, In addition to doing all of these things to put you into Song Lien's perspective, the film powerfully puts you into Song Lien's perspective by not showing you the master but by allowing you to feel his presence through these shots because this is how she feels this is how she feels all the time she's walking through these spaces and she's so rarely interacting with the man who basically owns the keys to her future and she doesn't see him but she feels him all around her even when he's not there this is the powerful thing that cinematography can do is it can create an emotional connection between you and a character by using these kinds of devices in really strategic, thoughtful ways. So I have one more, uh, one more slide that I want to show you because uh, I said that 95% of the time the master was represented uh, through those kinds of long shots. Like he's associated more frequently with a certain kind of camera shot 
than he is as he's not, you know, he's not really defined as a character except by those shots and the fact that he uh, owns the house and has all these women. Um, so I said that's 95% of the time. This is like the 5% of the time that's not the case. This is the one and only time that the film ever cuts in close uh, to see the master. And you can see why the erroneous assumption persists that he doesn't actually appear in the film because even in this shot, his back is turned. So again, like it's, it's even like, this is like 30 seconds of a two hour movie, but like even this 30 second snippet of film, which seems to be such a throwaway kind of shot in the movie is still very, very careful about controlling what you can and cannot see. Like this isn't really quite off screen space anymore, but it is speaking to the larger point that I'm trying to make, which is that there are no small decisions in movie making. Every little thing that you can do with the camera, with the actors in relation to the camera, with things you can put between the actors and the cameras. In this case, there's that gauze again, it's back, here it is, it's all exciting. All of these things impact the story that you're telling. And the difference between a really good movie and a really great movie is often in those details. Like how carefully have they lined up cinematic decisions about the camera and filters and light and so on and so forth with what the script is saying and doing. Good movies may have a really, really great script and very competent use of cinematography and mise-en-scene, but the really, really great films, uh, my argument to you would be, are creating intense resonance and connection uh, between what's happening in the story and like how it's being represented. And the reason why the, the great films do that is because Emotion doesn't just come from what the actors say and do. It comes from all of this stuff, like with cinematography and mise-en-scene that you may not notice on your first viewing, but is powerfully impacting uh, the emotional vibe you are getting from the scene, powerfully act, you know, c controlling how you are identifying with or not identifying with certain characters. So uh, this leads me to the very, very last slide of this presentation, um, and it will just have a few uh, studying suggestions. Sometimes these are called uh, journal suggestions, but uh, you can think of these as just things to write about or think about or pose with your TAs, um, but just recommended next steps for uh, processing this material and understanding it uh, on your own terms. And my advice is really pretty simple. Like take a few terms from the reading or from this lecture and s apply them to, uh, one of the scenes from the film, like either one of the scenes that we have, uh, talked about, uh, in this lecture, or maybe a scene that you look at with your TAs, uh, in the Friday classes, maybe, maybe a scene, uh, that we haven't looked at. But I would encourage you to start applying some of these terms uh, from the textbook and the lecture to uh, some of the scenes while you're watching the film, as it'll do a lot to help make this material stick. And then the second thing I would recommend you do is uh, kind of building on my, my riffing on the master being represented through off-screen space. Like, think about what these devices are doing for your interpretation of the film. If it's a really, really good film, and I think it's fair to say that Raise the Red Lantern is, uh, you're going to be seeing that these devices are used very purposefully to control how you interact with and think about uh, these characters in the film. All right, good stuff. Uh, as always, uh, don't ever hesitate to email me with questions and thoughts or schedule an office hours appointment. I'm um, happy to talk more about cinematography with any of y'all. Uh, so just let me know. Um, hopefully you found this useful and uh, have at it. Cameras, lights, action, right? <laughs>